Okay. In that case, I'll get started. So um, last week's lectures were all about consumer resource models. So this is a very broad uh, set of models. Previously, we were looking at uh, competition models where there was symmetrical competition. Possibly the strength of competition would be symmetric, um, but there would both be, you know, the presence of one species always negatively affects the other. We also had mutualism where they positively affect each other. And now we're moving on to general forms of models where there's one positive, one negative um, interaction. Uh, these are, I, I frame these as consumer resource models because they essentially are, they also might be uh, referred to as exploiter models. Uh, the ones we've been doing in the last week or so have been predator prey models. When we get on to doing uh, infectious disease models, the same kind of uh, principles apply. You know, your consumer in that case is your uh, parasite or pathogen, and your uh, resource is your host population. Okay, so there's going to be lots of uh, lots of stuff going forward about these consumer resource models. Um, a lot of the predator prey models were inspired, or at least the original ones were inspired by. Um, say population cycles between uh, lynx and hares and we've been trying to develop these models to understand okay what kind of principles within those systems might um, or what kind of mechanisms might we need to generate those kinds of dynamics that tells us something fundamental about what's really going on in those populations so the first predator prey model from last week was a very simple lock of Volterra model um, and that produced neutrally stable oscillations uh, so there's a center there, you have imaginary eigenvalues, kind of non-trivial equilibrium. This means you get oscillations, because whenever you have any imaginary or complex eigenvalues, you have oscillations. Um, but those oscillations were structurally unstable. And what that really means is that if you get nudged a little bit off one of those orbits, you don't return to the same orbit or cycle that you're on before. So that's kind of bad because in natural systems, they'll wander down a little bit due to noise, and eventually you would hit one of the axes and one of the populations would go extinct. So it's not a great model, but it's not a bad first model. We then looked at how, what happens if we have um, uh, resource-limited growth in the absence of predation for our prey population. And then we saw that we've got oscillations, but they're stable. Uh, we get a stable spiral around our trivial equilibrium, right? So those oscillations will decay over time. And in fact, you can show that noise, like environmental noise, can kind of bump your system away from that non-trivial equilibrium and can be maintained. But in a deterministic sense, they'll always decay to zero. So today we're going to look at our final predator-prey model. It's a more advanced one um, called the rosenzweig macarthur model. Uh, this allows us to give us something called limit cycles. So these are we can, we can get stable limit cycles where you'll turn towards a period of periodic orbit. And then if you move away from those due to, say, some environmental fluctuations, you'll get pulled back towards those. OK, so by the end of today, we'll understand these limit cycles, something called a Hopf bifurcation. This should be, I think, the last bifurcation we introduce. There might be one more um, in this course. And then something called the paradox of enrichment. OK, so just to recap. In the last lecture, we looked at a resource consumer model that looks like this, where we have logistic growth for our resource, our prey. We have a predation term that's linear. So this is a Holling type one predation term. And then we have just a, a normal um, linear death rate for our consumer, our predator. Okay, so like I said in my introduction just now, whilst this solves the structural instability, those oscillations not returning to um, where they were before, block voltage predator prey model, um, here the oscillations, um, they're not structurally unstable anymore, but they decay away. So let's see if we can get towards some limit cycles where they don't decay. Okay, so let's modify this model. So start with our resource. I'm going to stick with our logistic growth. So A is our intrinsic growth rate for our resource or prey, and K is its carrying capacity. And now we're going to assume that rather than having a Holling type 1 or a linear predation term, we're going to have a Holling type 2 predation term. So this is a case where, let's zoom in over here to sketch it, our functional response ends up looking something like this, 
where it saturates as our resource density increases. If I call this some G of R. Okay, so there's no switching of prey of to, to a different type of resource at low densities, but there's a handling time. So if you keep increasing the resource density, the uh, predators can't or consumers can't keep consuming it at those rates. So it tails off. So what does that look like? If you remember from when we introduced these holing type uh, one to three responses, we have our attack rate, which is here B, our consumer density, our resource density, R. And then we have to divide this by one plus our attack rate B times some handling time H times by our resource density R. Note that this is different to the case where we had, for example, R squared. That was like in the spruce budworm model. We're not having those squares here. If you do have the squares there, you have a function that looks a bit more like this, which indicates that you're switching to a different type of food source when they're at low density. Okay, so we're not doing that purple one, we're doing the green one here. I'm just going to remove that so I have room to write this in. Okay, so that's our resource equation. And then we need our consumer equation, dcdt. Here, and we're going to have a little upside here somewhere between zero and one telling us what's the efficiency of conversion. Then we have our predation term, just as it is in the other equation. So BCR over one plus EHR. And then we're going to keep our linear death rate minus DC that we had previously. So we've already met this idea of a handling time before. H is our handling time, some positive number. And zoom out a little bit. I've written these in their sort of full form here. As we've done before, we can non-dimensionalize them. I'm not going to show the full process of non-dimensionalization because that takes a bit of time and I want to focus more on the, the some of the analysis and, and conceptual understanding of this model. But I'd encourage you to have a go at using these substitutions to get from these equations to the ones I'm about to write down. Okay, so I'll leave that as an exercise. But it can be shown that we can simplify this model using these parameter substitutions to get dx little t is equal to x times by 1 minus x over kappa. So x is going to be our um, is a rescaling of our um, resource density. It's not going to be between zero and one now. We're not rescaling by its carrying capacity. We're actually using a slightly different rescaling than other rescalings we've done before. The reason we're doing this rescaling is because it ends up simplifying some of the the null clients and some of the analysis later. Okay, our, our predation term is going to be x y over one plus x. So x is going to be our population, our resource. And dy dt, I'm writing this form here, beta times by x over 1 plus x minus alpha times by y. Like I said, it's a slightly different way of uh, doing non-dimensionalization to what we've done before. But the same principle that we've rescaled time. And we've done some rescaling to our um, resource and consumer populations. And like I said, this is known as the, as the Rosenzweig McCarth model. In case you want to look up. Okay. So we've non dimensionalized it. We can also do a little bit more manipulation. In fact, I'll leave this up here so we can still see those equations. So we can rewrite these equations in a slightly different form, which helps us a little bit with the analysis. Okay. So if I notice here, I've got an x here and an x here in my dx dt equation. I have this one plus x here on them as well. I'm going to pull this all out the front as a common factor. Okay, so if I pull out x over one plus x, then I'll need to multiply this first term now by one plus x. So I've just divided it by one plus x. So I'll have a one plus x here so that those will now cancel. And I had a one minus x over kappa. And then we now just have a minus y. It'll hopefully become a little bit clearer in a moment as to why I've done that. I've taken out this x times by one, sorry, x over one plus x here. We also have an x over one plus x in our dy dt equation. So that's why I have taken that. 
so dy dt here. I'm going to write this x over 1 plus x is just f of x. I have a minus alpha. I haven't really changed anything there. Here, yeah, that means I can write f of x times by g of x minus y for that dx dt equation. All I've done here then is I define this f of x to be x over 1 plus x. And g of x is equal to 1 plus x times by 1 minus x over kappa. OK, I appreciate that this is probably looking a little bit mysterious as to where I'm going with this. I'll also say as well, that this is probably the most complicated model in the entire course, OK? So if you don't understand everything that I'm doing first time, I would definitely go back and, and relook at the notes. But this is definitely, I would say, the most complicated model in the course. So. Have that as a little caveat if you're not understanding everything first time, OK? OK, so why have I done this? Well, I've now got this dx dt as some function of x times by another function of x minus y. OK, so I've got these two things multiplied together. And here I've got the same f of x now occurring in my dy dt equation. And I've got a y on the outside and some constant. So both of these terms in these brackets some function here, y, sorry, f g of x minus y, and then some other function over here, f of x minus alpha. If I'm interested in my null lines, then I would either need to have, say, for my dx dt, it's f of x equal to zero, or the bin the brackets equal to zero. So that's either f of x is equal to zero or y equal to g of x. So I know that if I plot this curve here, then I'm going to be able to get an null line. Likewise, up here, I'm going to have an f of x is equal to alpha is another null line. I can just set my function f of x equal to a constant, or y is equal to zero. So, so it's a little bit of a mysterious way of writing these things at first. I appreciate that I might not be entirely clear why we do that, but it's all about trying to um, simplify how we can sketch our null lines and ultimately tell us something about the stability of these. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's think about our null plans. So for our prey population, like I said, we are going to have a null cline that either f x must equal zero or this g of x minus y must equal zero. So f of x equals x over one plus x which is equal to zero if and only if x is equal to zero. So we've got a null cline at zero, x is equal to zero. And the second null cline was the bit in the brackets, g of x is equal to y. So when is y to g of x? Well, that's just the function we defined on the previous slide, one plus x times by one minus x over kappa. So this is, one of my null lines for species x, and this is the other one. So x is equal to zero is just a straight line. It's just a vertical horizontal line on, oh, sorry, vertical line on the axis. And this here, we've got, this is a quadratic in x. It's going to, uh, it's got a negative sign in front of my x squared. So it's going to be like this shape. So it'll have a peak somewhere it turns out it has a peak somewhere in the positive quadrant, as long as we choose sensible parameters. So we should be able to sketch that. It's just a quadratic and a straight line. And then for our predator, let's go to my predator equation here. Here, the y must equal zero, or f of x must equal alpha. So y is equal to zero, or f of x is equal to alpha. So we need x over 1 plus x to equal alpha. We can rearrange that a little bit. So we can write this as x is equal to alpha times by 1 plus x. Let's do a little bit more rearranging. 
take everything over to one side, so we're going to have an x minus alpha x. In fact, I'll leave my alpha on the side. And then if I divide through by 1 minus alpha, I'll have x is equal to alpha over minus alpha. We can also write this as f inverse of alpha. So now I've got these two null kinds here, this one here, y is equal to zero, and x is equal to alpha over one minus alpha as my null, col null kinds for the pressure population. This is just a horizontal line on the, on the axis. This x is equal to alpha over one minus alpha. Well, alpha is just a, a parameter in the model. It's just a constant, right? We might vary that constant as we see what happens to the behavior, but it's just a constant. And x is equal to that constant, so that's just going to be a vertical line at some value given by alpha over 1 minus alpha. So we've got three straight lines, two of them vertical, one of them horizontal, and then a quadratic. So for the sake of time, we're going to just, and sort of interest as well, we're going to limit our analysis to the case where this second predator null line, which is where we have x is equal to f inverse of alpha, that's less than kappa. It becomes clear when you sketch this out what happens. We basically, we've got, I zoom in here to sketch what we're going on. We're going to have something that looks like this, where we have a parabola that corresponds to this null line 1 plus x times by 1 minus x over kappa. And then we're going to have some other line here, which is going to be x is equal to alpha over 1 minus alpha. And roots of this quadratic are going to be 0 and kappa, if I remember rightly. We're definitely going to have a kappa here. What we want is this green vertical line to be to the left of that. That's all that condition at the bottom of this slide was saying. If this is over here, then there's going to be no intersection. Okay. So we're just, all we're doing is we're limit, limiting our analysis to when it's between zero and kappa here. Okay. So when we do this, we're ensuring there's a biologically realistic coexistence equilibrium. And this occurs at this g of x. That's that um, quadratic when that intersects this vertical line f inverse of alpha. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to our equilibria. Again, I'll leave this as an exercise, but it turns out that there are three equilibria for the system. I've had a lot of practice of doing equilibria, so I won't go through that again here. It's good practice for you guys to have a go at doing that yourself. So like in many cases, we have zero, zero when there's no predators, no prey. We have a trivial equilibrium. Nothing happens. Nothing's there. Nothing happens. We have a semi-trivial equilibrium at kappa zero, where our predator is extinct and we just have our prey. And then finally, we have one at some non-zero values, x star, y star, which occurs at f inverse of alpha. So that's that alpha over 1 minus alpha. And whatever my value of g, the other null line, the quadratic one, whatever that is, at this value of x, which we can write as g of f inverse of alpha. Brackets there. This is my coexistence or non trivial equilibrium. And this is valid or biologically realistic for f inverse of alpha being less than kappa. So we've got three equilibria. We're not going to focus on the tri trivial and semi trivial ones because those are kind of boring. We're going to be focusing on what happens around this coexistence equilibrium here assuming it's been valid, okay? Okay, our Jacobian of this system. So 
for Jacobian, in fact, what I'll do is I'll copy the equations over. So we're going to have this f of x times weight of x minus y for our dx dt. We can have f of x times by g of x minus y. And then our dy dt, if you recall, we had beta times by f of x minus alpha times by y. So you guys have taken quite a few Jacobians by now, so this should be relatively straightforward. These are just functions here, so we can write things in terms of those functions. So for the first one, we're going to take a derivative with respect to x. We're going to have f of x times by g of x here. So we're going to have f of x times by g prime of x. So it's just product rule plus f prime of x times by stuff in the brackets, g of x minus y. f of x times by the derivative of the thing in the brackets plus derivative of f of f times y in the brackets. Okay, it's just product rule. There's only one y in the dx dt equation. So we're gonna have a minus f of x. So if minus f of x times by y, take the derivative with respect to y, we're just gonna get minus f of x. That's linear in, in terms of y. And then the second equation. We're going to have beta y times by f prime of x for our derivative or partial derivative with respect to x. And then the bottom right entry, this is again linear in y. So we're going to have beta f of x minus alpha the y disappears. So that's just finding our Jacobian. Now we want to find out what is the Jacobian at our coexistence equilibrium. So we can write it here as x star g of x star is one way of doing it. This is just this one up here. Okay. So what do we notice here? Well, at our coexistence equilibrium, if it exists, if you recall, we had f of x being equal to alpha. That was our, our vertical line that I drew that intersected with the quadratic, okay? So if f of x is equal to alpha, then this is just going to be equal to zero, this bottom right entry here. So at our coexistence equilibrium, this bottom right entry here is going to go to zero. What else do we see? If we go all the way back up here just for a moment, at our coexistence equilibrium, pink now, this is also going to be equal to zero. So that's our, our quadratic, if you remember, that's the quadratic null line. That must be equal to zero. And this thing here must also be equal to zero. So wherever we see a g of x minus y or an f of x minus alpha in our Jacobian, we can set those equal to zero. So that means that that term and this term here both go to zero. So we'll just be left with an f of x star, g prime of x star, minus f of x star and beta y f prime of x star, which looks a little bit simpler. What else do we know? We just said that f of x star is equal to alpha. So we're going to have alpha instead of this f of x star here. g prime of x star is a bit more complicated, so I'm just going to leave that in terms of g prime of x star. As I just said, f of x star is equal to alpha. So that one over here is going to go to a minus alpha. The bottom left entry, we're not going to change anything except to say that our y is going to be equal to g of x star. And we're still going to have that f prime of x star. And then we have still have zero in the bottom right. Okay, hey, can anyone tell me what's the name of the criteria that we need to use? You know, we can find our eigenvalues and sign of those eigenvalues, but we can also look at our trace and determinant will tell us something about the stability. 
Can you tell me what the name of the those criteria are? Ralph Howitt's criteria? Something about? No. Hopefully it might. <laughs> okay. The Ralph Howitt's criteria tell us basically by looking at the trace and the determinant of our Jacobian, the signs of those will tell us whether something is stable or unstable. Okay. So the coexistence equilibrium is going to be technically locally asymptotically stable. So we will tend towards it in the local region of it. If and only if our trace of our Jacobian is negative. And in this case, our trace is just going to be alpha times by G prime of X. Alpha times by G prime of X star, in fact. Okay. Because we had a zero at the bottom, we didn't have to add anything to this. So we need this to be negative. So what do we know about this? Well, our alpha is just positive. That's just a positive parameter. So that's always positive. And so our trace, the sign of our trace is going to entirely depend on this G prime of X star. I'll come back to this in a moment as to exactly what this, this represents, okay? So that's our first condition for our Ralph Hurwitz criteria. We also need to look at the determinant. So our determinant of our Jacobian. Well, the elements on the main diagonal here and here, they're going to go to zero because we're going to multiply them together. And then we'll subtract product of the elements of the off diagonal. Here are matches for trapped. And element, so we multiply the elements on the off diagonal and we're subtracting them. So the negative sign is going to cancel out in front of the alpha. And we're going to have alpha, beta, g of x star, and f prime of x star. And we need this to be positive and the trace to be negative to have our coexistence equilibrium being stable. So what do we know about the determinant? Well, alpha and beta are both positive. G of x star, that's just going to be a, a positive number as well. We're assuming that our coexistence equilibrium is biologically realistic. So this is our y coordinate. Therefore, it's going to be our predator population density. So that's got to be positive as well. And then this f prime of x star, well, I'll show with a little bit of algebra. If you take the derivative of x, over one plus x, you'll get one over one plus x squared. And this is always positive. So that means that f prime of x star, whatever x star is, is also going to be positive. So that means that this second condition here is always satisfied. Our determinant is always positive at coexistence equilibrium whenever it's realistic. So that means the stability depends entirely on the trace. We need this to be negative. And so stability depends entirely on the sign of this g prime of x star. So after all of that analysis, we just need to look at that function g prime of x star. So what is the value of that, that or the, the gradient of that null climb when it intersects with the other null climb? So the gradient of the null climb at our coexistence equilibrium tells us whether it were going to be stable or unstable. What else do we see? Well, if g prime of x, just to clarify that, if g prime of x star is negative, then um, our coexistence equilibrium is going to be stable, and if g prime of x star is positive, then it's going to be unstable. Okay. We can also see if g prime of x star is going to be equal to zero, we're going to be on the, the threshold between stability and instability. But we also have that our trace is going to be zero, and our determinant is going to be positive. Can anyone remember what we get if we have a, a zero trace? and a positive determinant. Can anyone tell me what we have? The name of, is how do, when we classify stability, you know, we're saying something's a node or a spiral or a saddle. It's saddle not a saddle point. We have a zero trace and positive determinant. Looking back through your notes to find it, I like I like your style. Uh, it's a center. 
you remember when we did the uh, the recorded lecture on the lock Volterra model last week? We ended up with imaginary eigenvalues. We had a zero trace essentially and a positive determinant. So we have a center. That means we have imaginary eigenvalues. So we're going to have some sort of oscillations going on, right? Because we have imaginary eigenvalues. And then if you imagine if you move just a little bit left or right of this, um, you know, we have an intersection and suppose we're right at the peak of that uh, quadratic. And that's where our coexistence is, equilibrium is. We're going to have a center there. So we have imaginary eigenvalues. If we shifted that line, that intersection a little to the left or to the right, we're probably going to have complex eigenvalues. So very close to this, we have complex eigenvalues. When we are on one side of it, we if we shift that intersection a little bit to the left or to the right, say one side is going to be stable, one side is going to be unstable. So that means that we're going to have stable spiral on one side and an unstable spiral on the other side and a center. So things will be spiraling in or spiraling out depending on where we are at. So let's think about this graphic, please. I appreciate that some of those things that I've been saying so far are a little bit hard to grasp first time, perhaps just looking at the math. So let's look at some phase planes essentially and see what happens, okay? So we've got our predator population Y, our prey population X. These are our null clients. So we had a, a null client X is equal to zero. We had a null client Y is equal to zero. Those are just the kind of trivial ones. And we had these two other null lines. One, this is our G of X, our, um, I actually sketched on earlier intersect this with a negative, has a negative root over here and a root over here at kappa. So this is just a quadratic. It's when G of X is equal to Y. And this is the same in each of these diagrams here. And then we have this other null line for our prey population when X is equal to F inverse of alpha. So this is just alpha over one minus alpha. And the difference between these three figures is we're just changing this value of alpha and therefore shifting this vertical line left or right. Okay, so on this diagram on the left here, our G prime of X is negative. I'm just going to zoom in for sketching. G prime X is negative, and we just found out before that we're going to have complex eigenvalues if we're close enough to this peak, and therefore we're going to be spiral. So our trajectories here end up looking something like this. We have a stable spiral when this G prime of X is negative. So the G prime of X is negative because there's gradient that blue curve at the intersection is negative. Okay, so we're pointing down. And here in the middle, when G prime of X stars equal to zero, so that's right at the peak, purely imaginary values, we've got a center. So our orbits will look something like this. And then we keep shifting this line a little bit to the left. Now, G prime of X star, the gradient of this blue curve at the intersection is positive. So we can have an unstable spiral. So that means now we spiral out like this. So whether we intersect on the left-hand side or right-hand side of that peak will affect whether we're spiraling in or spiraling out. So to answer that question, then what happens is system as we as this G prime X star passes through zero, the gradient here passes through zero, we're switching from being a stable spiral to a center to an unstable spiral. In other words, we're oscillating in, oscillating around, but neither moving in or moving away, and then oscillating away. So it's a start to something called the Hopf bifurcation theorem. This is this is it in its general form here. What it's basically saying is if we have two equations, we'll think of these in terms of species, just like we've been talking to now. So you have two populations, X and Y. And then we've also written this parameter mu here. So the mu is just some parameter of the system. Okay. In our case, the key parameter is going to be our foot parameter. So it's just written some parameter of our system, mu. And we're saying that mu affects the stability of some equilibrium, X star, Y star. And we say that if 
that equilibrium is stable in a certain range of mu, but becomes unstable as mu passes through some bifurcation value. So it's stable. We pass through the bifurcation value, it becomes unstable. And again, it doesn't matter which way we do that. You can go unstable to stable. There's just a critical value of a parameter where we go from stable to unstable. And at the same time, if we do our linear stability analysis, if we linearize about our equilibrium and we get complex eigenvalues close to this critical bifurcation value, such that the sign of our real part of the eigenvalue changes at this critical point. Remember, the sign of this real eigen, real part of the eigenvalue is going to tell you whether you're spiraling in or spiraling out. So it's basically what we had on the previous slide. Then if also we don't go through zero for our imaginary part, then we have something called a limit cycle. So this here is just essentially a, a, a mathematical summary of, of what we had on this previous slide here in a general form, okay? Here our critical value would be mu c here is equal to whatever here. Oh, sorry, I should write it as mu is equal to mu c. And say here we've got mu less than mu c and here mu greater than mu c, okay? These are just, I guess, some parameters in a general form. This here is just summarizing what we have graphically written down here mathematically, okay? So see if we go from stable to unstable, add some bifurcation value, and at that point, we have um, complex eigenvalues close to it, and we have a uh, imaginary eigenvalues at that bifurcation parameter, then we have a limit cycle. One thing we don't know is whether this limit cycle is actually stable or unstable. That's something a bit beyond this that we're not going to get into. What we will focus on is what is a stable limit cycle. So it does actually turn out that we have stable limit cycles in this model. And that means if we sketch something like our prey density versus our predator density over time, so these are just like our trajectories and our phase planes. If we say start, say start here, we'll go in and get pulled into some orbit. If we started in here, we would get pulled out to that orbit as well. This here is just the same as this, but those, those different trajectories separated out. So you get pulled to a stable periodic orbit, and if you get in shock, but you get pulled back onto it. So you can kind of think of this as being a bit like a racetrack, and everything wants to be on that racetrack. If you get nudged off it, you want to try and come back onto it, okay? So if you started off, say, at some value here, you would get pulled out until eventually you tended towards that same limit cycle, okay? So our non-trivial equilibrium is just some value here in the middle. And it's saying that when we have an unstable spiral around that, we're going to spiral out to this limit cycle. So although our non-trivial equilibrium is unstable, when we have this stable limit cycle here, we don't keep going out forever. We get pulled into this stable periodic orbit. And likewise, if we're on the other side of this, we'll get pulled into it. We don't ever tend towards the equilibrium. If you're out here, you can't cross through this limit cycle, okay? So it's not stable in the sense of like a stable spiral would. You get pulled in and those oscillations get damped forever. You get pulled in, but only pulled in to this limit cycle. Here, you get pushed out. Again, you can't get pushed out to infinity, you get pushed out to this limit cycle. So you can almost think this is like a barrier that you can't cross, okay? This black line that's kind of going around here. And you tend towards it, but you can never cross it. Just as a little aside as well, whenever we're doing these phase planes with these trajectories, the trajectories can never cross. Okay, I'm not sure if that's clear or not from anything else so far. Whenever you're drawing these trajectories, they can never cross. Because if they cross, that means that your direction field at a particular point would have two ways in which they could go. Your direction field must always point in just one direction. It doesn't matter where it's going up, down, left, right, or some combination of those. But you can't point in two different directions at one point. So these trajectories can never cross. Because that means that all of these ones out here, they get pulled in until they're basically on that limit cycle there. These ones get pushed out, but they never cross each other, okay? 
So what does that mean? That's saying, okay, well, if we think about a biological interpretation of this, suppose we start off down here. We have some low value for prey and some low value for predators. So maybe that corresponds to being on the right over here, some low value here. Initially, our prey density is going to increase. So prey goes up like this. That allows our predator population to grow because there's lots of food around. As that predator population grows, though, so we're now heading in this direction, they're eating prey, so the prey population is going to start to shrink. And so the prey population starts to go down. So we go down here. As the predators start to run out of food, the predator pay population is going to start to decrease. This red curve goes here, and we end up basically back at the beginning. Key thing here is that these oscillations get pulled into some stable orbit, and they'll have the same amplitude and same period in the long term. Okay. The very last thing, I appreciate today has been a lot of like quite heavy math to go through. Why do we care about any of this? Well, one of the cool things this is that it means that we've, we've been able to get those stable cycles, like the lynx hair populations, you know, they had those um, there were data on their pelts going back well over a century, showing that they were fluctuating. They were fluctuating with different amplitudes, but that's more driven by environmental noise or how much, like how well they were that year and so on. But, you know, those oscillations were going on indefinitely. They weren't structurally unstable. They're likely to be limit cycles. And the, uh, the other thing with that is that we've been able to replicate those kinds of dynamics and we've been able to do it in a way that's, that's structurally stable in this model that we didn't have in our lock or term. It's kind of a, a bit of a better model, but it's also more complicated. And whenever we're models, we need to think about that balance between complexity and, and realism. Okay, what does this have to do with something called the paradox of enrichment? Well, suppose initially that we have our G prime of X star being negative. So if I just go back up to this slide here, suppose initially we're on this left-hand side here. So this happens to correspond to uh, a particular value. This is kappa here, and a particular value of x star here. That's our initial system, OK? Now imagine what would happen if we said, OK, we're going to increase the resources available to our prey population. What does that actually do? Well, that black vertical line doesn't change at all. If we increase the resources available for our prey population, that's going to increase this cap. This is a rescaled version of our carrying capacity, right? Let's think about what happens if we increase this cap. We're making things better for our prey population. At the moment, in this scenario here, we have a stable spiral. Things towards those, those uh, tend in towards that uh, equilibrium to start with. Everything's fine. No one's happy. We're now going to increase the uh, resources for this prey. So what we're doing is we're dragging this intercept over this side. As we do, we're dragging the, the maximum as well. And we know what we really care about is the gradient of that blue line at the intersection of that pink dot. So if we start dragging this this way, that's some functionally equivalent to moving this black line to the left, which we just drew. So as we increase this kappa, We'll get to a point where we pass through this uh, this center point, the maximum, and now g prime of x star is positive and have an unstable uh, spiral, which leads us to a limit cycle. And we can keep increasing more and more and more, so that limit cycle gets bigger and bigger. What does that will mean then? Well, it means that if we increase the resources for our prey population, you know, that's going to make it better. There's going to, this system is going to be more stable, right? Because the prey can have more food. But if we do that, what we're really doing is we're saying we're shifting the peak of this G of X further to the right, and it destabilizes our system from this stable equilibrium into these limit cycles. And these limit cycles might be stable for a while, but for example, we might have a situation that looks something like this, where initially, as we We've got x versus y here. We have some relatively low value of kappa. We have something that looks like this. 
That's why we have a relatively low kappa. And then as we increase kappa, now we're going to end up in these stable limit cycles. And these stable limit cycles might push our populations to relative low levels. It might look something like this in the end. So this is for our high K, or high kappa. If we think about being close, starting off close to that equilibrium, we would start spiraling out from it looking like this until we get pulled into that limit cycle. So now, even though we've added resources to the system, we think, oh, that's great. We've actually destabilized it. It was all happy for this nice stable equilibrium. We've destabilized it. So we've got, it's going through these big fluctuations in prey and predator population sizes. And it could be that they, you, you increase those oscillations so much that they get very close to these axes and just stochastically one of them is driven extinct. So this is the paradox of enrichment, that basically increasing the availability of resources, enrichment, of an environment is not necessarily good for ecosystems. We go from this nice, stable situation into this situation over here where we have these limit cycles. If they get too large, those limit cycles can end up potentially driving the populations extinct. So these, these limit cycles are still stable in a sense. When I say destabilizing, I mean from going from a just a fixed value to being fluctuating values. But because those values are potentially very low at some point in this, this orbit, you could drive the populations extinct just by random variation. Okay. We've got a couple minutes left. Does anyone have any questions about anything that we've gone through today? Like I said at the start, this is quite, it's definitely, I would say, the most complex model in the course. Don't worry if you don't get it all straight away, but maybe go back and, and process it and see if you have any questions and, and be more than happy to answer this at like office hours and stuff. But does anyone have any questions at this time? Yes. So I wasn't sure. Do you Sorry, the, 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 which, sorry, this slide, no? no, no. Um, at the back, um, no pines. All the way, all the way back earlier on. Uh, yeah, yeah. To here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, so, uh, as uh inverse alpha is is only change the sign on the uh, bottom as one. Because f is uh, x over uh, one plus x, right? Uh, so, yeah, f of x is x over one plus x, yeah? Yeah, yeah. so inverse only change the uh, change to be uh, one minus r, right? Uh, so if you get this equation here, so this is our f of x is equal to alpha, and you, if we say, okay, we want to rearrange this now for x, because this is essentially alpha in terms of x, if we want to get it x in terms of alpha, then if you multiply both sides by one plus x, then you'll get this over here, x is equal to alpha times by one plus x, yeah? And then if we now subtract, you know, we could expand this out just to make sure it's clear. So here, this is x is equal to alpha plus alpha x. So we can subtract alpha x from both sides and we'll get x minus alpha x is equal to alpha. Yeah. And we can write this as x times by one minus alpha is equal to alpha. And then as long as, I didn't say that as long as alpha is not equal to one, but as long as alpha is not equal to one, we can divide through to get x is equal to alpha over one minus alpha. Does that make sense? Oh. So this is uh, f inverse. Yeah, and this is this is my F inverse of alpha. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? No? Oh, Scott, yeah. So if you're outside of that limit cycle, you that you don't need to get pulled towards it. Mm -hmm. And then like stay on it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. so you get pulled pulled into it. I didn't go through here. There's not really enough time to go through like um showing whether we have stable or unstable limit cycles. So an unstable limit cycle would be one 
that looked something like, let me just sketch one here. Suppose this is an unstable limit cycle. What that would look like is your trajectories. Suppose it goes something around like something like this. Oop. That's an, if this is an unstable limit cycle, then here we would get pushed away from it. So you would spiral in in the center like this. And uh, outside, if you moved off it, it would spiral away. So in that case, it would be pushing you off it. We don't encounter these ones. So we're just going to focus. It can be shown that the, what we've got here is a stable one. A stable one is the opposite where you would get pushed out from the center and then pulled out from outside. So this is an example of an unstable limit cycle there. But what we've got here turns out to be a stable limit cycle where, yeah, you get pulled into it from the outside and pushed towards it from the inside.